Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? I'm doing good, Jake. How you doing? Always making it happen. Just trying to get my piece of the action today. You know, we'll see what happens, right? I'll try to cooperate, bro. Just, just beat me down if you have to today, okay? <laughs> All right, before we get started, let's give a quick shout out to our sponsor, CrowdStreet, who knows you don't have to know a guy to find a quality commercial real estate investment opportunity. Learn more at CrowdStreet.com backslash wheelbarrow. And for visiting their site, they're going to give you a free gift. Very nice of those folks. Today's guest is Devin Elder. Devin is a multifamily syndicator from San Antonio, Texas, who has completed over 100 residential and commercial investment projects since 2012. Gino. We're going to get it rocking today, huh? We're getting Dude, multifamily over investing. 100. Wow, that's a lot, that's bro. Awesome. In six years. Woo. That's awesome. So without further ado, Devin, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you. It's our pleasure. Tell us, tell us how you got started as a syndicator and, and you jumped into real estate. Yeah, I started out in the single family world. I think like a lot of people, it was easier to wrap my head around. It was uh, easier from a capital perspective. You know, I was... I come from the corporate world. After I graduated college, I, I dive kind of headfirst in the corporate world and thought that was going to be my, my thing. Um, so I started out in single family, but I was fortunate enough to also, when I started my real estate investing journey in 2012, to, be, uh, to, to meet some multifamily guys kind of right out of the gate. And so I knew that I didn't have the capital to, um, at the time, get started in multifamily. So I started in single family, but the goal was always to be able to snowball capital, build those relationships, build my education, and one day get into multifamily. So it took a couple of years of doing single family, uh, and then I started with small multifamily, and then it's, it's really just kind of snowballed from, from there. So why'd you get out of the corporate world? You know, fundamentally for me, I just, I think I have a, uh, I'm hardwired kind of to have this entrepreneur, entrepreneur mentality where I don't really, uh, um, I don't want to answer to anybody. I think at the end of the day is ultimately it. And then there's also this freedom component in terms of time and money that I just did not see a way to create in the corporate world. There was always guys above me that I knew were making good money, but they lived at the office. They were super stressed out. I, I, I never had any heroes in the corporate world. I, all my heroes were always entrepreneurs. So the guys in the corporate world, you know, that, that could have been heroes, for me, they were almost like anti-heroes. They were guys that I looked at and said, man, I do not want to be this guy in 10 years. You know, he makes, makes good money, but the rest of his life is completely out of whack. Who, who are some of those entrepreneurial heroes that you had? For, early on was my older brother. Uh, my older brother, Jesse, is five years older than me, and he owned karate schools and was uh, really an entrepreneur from the get-go. I don't know that he never had like a regular job. So I always had that as a beacon. And then there's the big guys, right? I mean, Elon Musk is a big hero of mine. Um, I've got a lot of friends that are multifamily syndicators that are a little further down the road from me, you know, guys that own 1,000 units or or 2000 units. And those were kind of always my, my heroes for like, I would say like the last five, six years. So it's a, it's a mishmash. So who pushed you into the college experience in the corporate world? Did you have like a mentor? Like I, you know, a lot of people say their family, their mom, their dad, their uncles. Did you have somebody saying, Hey, this is great. Get a job, you know, go to college, get a job. No, you know, I never did. What's funny is my older brother was always pushing me in the other direction. You know, he's like, don't go to college, don't get a job. I just, at the time when I was a kid, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And also, I mean, look, I went to college, I got a, I got a four-year degree, and I suppose I got some value out of it. But I think at the time for me, it was just keeping me out of trouble. You know, you're 18 years old, I'm going, man, if I don't go to college, what, what am I going to what am I gonna do? I don't, I don't know what I'm going to, I hadn't found my calling yet or anything. So I think college at that time in my life kind of kept me out of trouble. And then the corporate world was really... Um, it was just by default. I just thought, you know, I'm getting, getting to be older here. I'm going to start a family at some point. I've got to make some kind of money. 
And so uh, I ended up diving into that world, and and it didn't take too many years before I was how just long? really kind of fed up with it. How, how many years? So I worked. Yeah, I worked for um, about ten years in the corporate world. What were you doing? And part of that. Part of the, I was working at a uh, an IT company doing tech sales for a hosting company, and then I was doing uh, some management, some operations stuff for a couple of different corporations over that kind of career. And then uh, a few of those years. I was burning the candle at both ends. Like I'd, I'd made a decision to do real estate. I didn't do it overnight. It took about two and a half, three years of really working hard on building the portfolio and going to work. And then at some point it just made sense to stop going to work because the opportunity cost of, uh, you know. But Devin, what was the breaking point? What was the why of real estate? What, what made it turn for you? Yeah, I love that question. I think everybody that's successful has got that, right? It got a very definitive point. And for me, it was very clear. Um, I got fired from one of my jobs. I'd, start, I'd taken a job at a, uh, like a small startup arm of a bigger company, I guess you could call it. And I was busting my tail like I never had in my life for this little company. And I was, felt like I was creating a ton of value and I was really putting my heart and soul into it. And then I got fired. And to me, that was like the biggest contrast you could have. Uh, to be let go from a job that I didn't feel like I was half-assing at all. I mean, I was really giving it my all. And so to give it my all and then be fired was like this giant wake-up call for me that, uh, unfortunately, I had already bought my first house and had a little taste of some returns on rental real estate. And I said, that's it. I'm going to get another job because I, I need the money, but I am never, I'm never going to get fired again. And so I found my next job. I found kind of a cush job that I wasn't, going to try to get a promotion in or anything, but I could just make a comfortable six figures and kind of cruise along. And while I built my portfolio and that was a very motivated, probably two and a half years. And I, so I, I made the decision that that was going to be my final corporate job. And it, and it was, but it was, uh, it was absolutely that pain that was, it was fueling all of that. De uh, Devin, before I ask the next question, I want Jake to share his story with you because it's it's very similar and maybe he can transition yeah. into his Taco Bell story. So Jake, take it away for me, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I mean, it's very similar. I was, uh, I was selling vaccines and um, I, uh, I, was, I was very miserable because there's a lot of regs that came down in the company. It was all performance-based. So you get a, you know, you, you really outperform, you get a nice commission, you feel good about it, rah, rah, everyone's rocking, right? And then, and then the company went to this whole thing where they, they started grading you on tests. And for the listeners, and, and I've probably talked about it, I, you know, I hated school. I was a miserable student. And, and so it was like, I went from like this, you know, we had a, like a, you know, we just kind of got out of college, a bunch of guys that were athletes were out there selling and, and, and really aggressive and things to this, okay, now you're getting graded on tests. So it was like this complete shift and it was just demoralizing. And then they started grading you on your performance in front of the, the doctors that you're selling. So your boss would come out with you and then they literally start like grading you as you're talking to the guy. I mean, if, if anyone knows me, that was like putting just a, a crazy animal in a cage. And, and so it, it was like such fuel to the fire though, because, you know, at that point we were, we just started getting into investing. And I think, was I out in two years, Gino? It was, yeah. it was 2013. I, I think I retired in about two years yes. and, and we built up the portfolio. So Gino's, you know, always picks on me about this, but uh, we were driving around and finally I had enough, you know, enough was enough. And we went down and uh, we pulled into uh, a Taco Bell one day and I ordered my, my chicken quesadilla. <laughs> and I said, all right, uh, love you guys, but uh, don't love you enough to stay. So I'm going to have to walk away. And, uh, nice. and, and that was it. So, you know, you, you got you to gotta pull the trigger to Taco Bell to do it right. Okay? And I want to so, yeah. piggyback <laughs> off of that. Let me piggyback off of that. You know the story better than I do. Cause he, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee about three months ago during a week of our live event. I'm sitting in a Starbucks with Jake. We're sitting in the corner. Some lady walks in and says, hey, Jake. So he says, hey, doesn't introduce me, blows me <laughs> off. He goes, sits nice. in the corner. He gets up and starts talking to her. So he doesn't even come over and say, hey, Gino, this is a so-and-so. We walk out, and I see this, his face is white. I'm like, bro, what's going on? He's like, that's my former boss. I'm like, dude, really? That's the one that you told to get lost at Taco Bell? You couldn't at least introduce yes. to her? So I don't even remember what she looks like, but it was the funniest thing in the world. If anyone knows NLP, man, the anger in his body just went to that state, and he was like, shut down. I was like, well, no, because I love my life so much, and it's so nice to be free and, and uh -huh. live life on my own terms. And then, you, you know, you, you feel like this slave prisoner because you know you need to do it because the money was fueling the real estate, paying for the house and all that stuff at the time. Right. And it was supporting, and you know you needed to do it. So it was like you you're being someone that you weren't. And it took me back to a time that was cringeworthy where I was like, 
oh, you did it because you knew you had to, but you, it's never a place you want to have to go back to. So I think, you know, it resonated a lot of the stuff you're saying. I, I was sitting, I'm, I'm laughing for the last five minutes, but it's just because I've been through the same shit that you're talking about. So it, yeah. it wasn't meant to be rude. It's just I've been there and it's cracking me up. And, and the reason why I want to convey that, I want to, you know, poke fun at Jake a little bit, but I think, I mean, ultimately, there's the two types of motivation. It's moving away from pain, what you guys are two describing, right? You move away from that pain. The pain's got to be stronger than being uncomfortable, right? And that's what both of you did. And moving towards pleasure, which is both what you guys are both doing right now. So if you have to exhibit or have that pain, let it be like lively. Make a, paint a picture of it because your mind works in pictures. So if you can paint the picture of that pain, and I saw Jake's picture vivid, right? And I saw that that is what got him going because Jake isn't, he was young at the time. He was in his early 30s. Usually guys have that epiphany when they get a little bit older. But fortunately for him, that pain was so strong. So if you guys want to get that motivation and get to the next level, make sure you pick that pain. And, and so here's real, real simple, right? So, so face goes white, probably sulking, right? Okay, yep. that was the life before. Now every day is air guitar and 80s rock, right? <laughs> We're jamming out to Journey. You know, we got a little Bon Jovi going every day, and it's, it's good. So that's, that's the difference, all right? Simple as that. I didn't mean to deviate, guys, but I thought that was important because I see a lot of guys who are entrepreneurs have the same story. So anyone listening to it, really figure out your why, figure out your pain points, and figure out what you want to do. Um, Jake, remember um, MJ DeMarco doesn't say – follow your passion, right? That's sometimes wrong. Follow what you're good at. Follow what you can make money at. Mm -hmm. That's what Devin was doing. He was actually making money to get to the next level, to get into the multifamily. And he saw maybe multifamily is not his passion, but I think financial freedom and dealing with entrepreneurs is, and multifamily is just a big. Here comes the ping pong. Devin, we're going to get back to you in a second, but no, this, I got I to gotta touch on this. The idea is you, you, you get a good at something, you get rewarded, you know, the money comes, you start feeling good about what you're doing. And then you have, you're creating free time to do what you enjoy. And the classic example is when I got out of college, I was a part-time personal trainer because I liked to work out. Lifting was fun. I always played football. I started hating it. People are like, you know, you're motivating people that didn't want to be there. So I started hating the gym. It started, it started ruining that aspect of my life that I was passionate about that I loved. So, so careful with that. It'd be very slippery slope where you go down and you're like, ah, man, I, I, you know, Gino loves cooking. Gino hates being a restaurant owner. You know, great cook, loves cooking with the family. That probably is a similar example where you work in the restaurant and you started hating it. But at home, you enjoy it. So you get away from that. You started doing what you love, gardening, et cetera. So, all right. So <laughs> he started this, a whole ping pong thing, right? Because he fired me up this morning. I was nice and calm this morning. This is the Devin Elder Show. Let me, Devin, let me this ask This is the Devin Elder Show, folks. What, we get back in just <laughs> what, did you, um, what did you figure out about single family homes? What did you like about them? And how, no, talk about your first deal. Yeah, my first deal was a little uh, two bedroom, one bath house in, it was about five blocks away from my father's house that I grew up in. And that was a very important step for me because um, th that neighborhood, you know what's funny, it's 2018, that neighborhood is going through this uh, renaissance, right? I mean, the, the values in that neighborhood are going crazy, but that's only in the last three years. So at the time in 2012, uh, when I bought the house, it was very important for me to kind of come back to this neighborhood that I grew up in that was really kind of run down and, and buy a little piece of it. It was like I had conquered a little piece of that neighborhood and I conquered a lot of my fear. And so it was a little uh, 10K rehab. I bought it with hard money, kind of just cosmetic fix up, put a tenant in it and refinanced out almost all my money. And that was kind of the magic trick that I, I said, well, I don't necessarily have to have a ton of capital if I can do this little house for like 10K or under. And once I'd done one, uh, you know, the first year I bought one house, the next year I bought 10 houses, right? Because I'd kind of figured out the model. So it was a, just a kind of a rinse and repeat of buy it with hard money. And then after a while, I started getting to private money after I built a little track record, buy it, fix it up, refinance out all my cash, stick a renter in it. Renter in it. Now I've got equity, I've got cash flow, I've got depreciation, I've got all these things that we know and love about real estate. Uh, and I stacked together enough of those to replace my income. So that was great, but I always knew I, I, I never wanted to be the guy that owned 150 single family houses because- A lot of work, man. 50 utility bills, 150 insurance policies, you know, even with third party management, they're all over the town. Uh, so I always knew I wanted to get into multifamily because it was going to scale better. It just took me a few years to kind of get to that capital, um, you know, build a piggy bank up enough to be able to, to pull the trigger on some multifamily stuff. So let me ask you a question. Does that strategy work today? Because I see a lot of these single family homes, what you were doing, you were buying right. That's what we preached. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. 
five, six years ago, you could buy these properties at 50 to 60% of wholesale. Now people are going in and doing turnkeys and are buying on retail. Do you see danger in that market? And I'm trying to get people into multifamily. I'm trying to let them see that's a barrier. They think it's a barrier to entry and it's great because you won't get in it. But what do you think about the single family home space right now? What are your opinions? Well, I still have a company that we buy and sell a lot of a single family, but we are, we've got a pretty good acquisition engine, right? I mean, we're, we're finding houses. We've got a lot of ways to do that. Um, the turnkey stuff, I've never done it. And I, I just wouldn't buy a single family house without 20, 30 K of equity in it. I don't know why you would do that because if you're buying something at retail and cash flowing a little bit, uh, you know, a 10, percent market correction is just going to put you in the hole quick and so I wouldn't even personally I, I don't I don't know why people fool with that um, it's definitely getting harder to find deals I mean I'm in San Antonio so this market it's definitely tighter uh, we still find them but my the only way I've ever operated in single family is you got to buy it way below market value for it to make sense so most of the stuff we're seeing from wholesalers doesn't make sense nothing on MLS makes sense I mean it's really we've got to dig deep and go you know, off market and find those to make sense. And still most of the stuff we look at doesn't make sense. You got to buy it right. Just like you said. What is the strategy that you said you're still buying single family homes? Are you flipping? Is that the idea? Yeah. So I, I, uh, I've done a lot of single family houses. I have, you know, a stable of private lenders. I've got contractors, I've got contacts and all that. I didn't want to just give that up when I made the transition to multifamily. So what I do was I, I built a really awesome team and I, my, all the credit goes to them, but I've got a designer, construction manager, two acquisition guys, and th that team really kind of runs itself because uh, they, they were able to step into um, the systems and, and everything that I created. So I spent actually very little amount of my time in that business, but it was already up and running and going, and it didn't make sense to just kill that revenue stream where I could just plug in some team members to kind of run that business. So I spent about 90% of my time on the multifamily business these days, but... Um, there was, you know, in my mind, there was no reason to just kill off a perfectly good revenue stream in a single family business. That's the speak of a true entrepreneur, Jake. Just don't give it away. You know what I'm saying? If it's working, <laughs> just plug in. And, and it's like that it's mindset just, just that a lot of people have. It's I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Well, if you can find somebody else to do it, that's awesome. So um, let's jump into yep. your first multifamily deal. Let's talk about the first multifamily deal you did. Yeah. So the first, the very first one I bought was a little six unit on the south side of town. Um, I, it was important for me not to have partners on it because I just didn't have the confidence level at that point to take anybody else's money. You know, I've been studying syndication. I knew people that were raising capital, but in my mind, I'm going, you know, I'm the whatever, 35 year old guy. I've got a little bit of a track record with these single family houses and I've done well there, but I just did not want to uh, go through a capital raise. I guess it was just fear. And looking back, I don't think I needed to start there. And that, that's what I tell other people. You, you don't need to start small. In fact, that's, that six unit was, you know, it's kind of a beast to run because I was the manager and everything. But I was able to get it with a, with a bank loan, just my capital, and I, I ran it for two and a half years. And it, uh, it was a great start. You know, it was, it was about the smallest thing you could buy and still be considered multifamily. But I got to go through the whole process by myself, do that. Um, you know, it was an equity multiple of about 2.4 over two and a half years. So it made good money for me. And it was just kind of that first toe in the water of, of getting into multifamily. Um, there wasn't a huge value add component there. I mean, I was able to take rents from five and a quarter to six and a quarter with a little bit of a, you know, $2,000 per unit kind of cleanup. And it was, it wasn't really anything spectacular about it. The property was in pretty good shape. It was on a quiet little street, you know, working class tenants and um, just kind of ran the thing for, for about two and a half on years. On a larger scale though, you love a deal like that. How do you mean? No, I mean, you go in, you get a hundred dollar rent bump. You don't spend much money on it. It's going to cash flow nicely for you. I mean, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. You just want, it's, it's the scale that was, it was kind of lacking. That's, ex that's exactly right. So yeah, a deal like that at a hundred units, love it. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely love it. Yep. Totally agree. So what was the turning point for you to get into syndication? What made you say, cause that's where Jake and I are right now. We're like, we're doing syndication. Yep. We've been struggling for the last 18 months to say, should we take other people's money? We felt like you did. Once you take other people's money, it's a totally different ball game. Because if you miss a month's draw, you're like, okay, Jake, we didn't make money this month. But getting investors on board, what was that turning point for you? You know, that, for, for me, that had always been the goal, right? I just, I needed to prove to myself that I could go out and buy this thing and run it and take all these concepts that I've been learning about and actually perform on it. 
And so once I did that on my own, that gave me a great degree of comfort to say, all right, let's scale this up. Let's realize some of those economies of scale, take this to a larger property, bring on some capital. And, it, you know, from my personal experience, I had already, at this point, I had already raised millions and millions of dollars and returned it on single family stuff. Right, yeah. So the first time a private lender gave me 150 K on a house instead of a hard money lender, that, that was, you know, that was a growing experience for me. But then I started to do it again and again and again. And, you know, done dozens of these houses. And so after a while, somebody wiring in 200K became to, to me kind of became just commonplace and just kind of ho-hum. So to take that to, you know, a $2 million capital raise in one shot on a multifamily deal just kind of made sense. It's like, well, I've, I've I've raised $2 million before on the single family stuff. It was just kind of spread out over time and multiple projects. And now I'm just doing it in one. So it was, it was really a natural progression. And this whole journey for me has just been me trying to convince myself that I'm capable of it. And then I do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So it's really a, it's really a, a, what is it? Man versus self kind of, <laughs> kind of story here for sure. So let me ask you on that first deal, Give me your thoughts. Give me your fears. Give me um, your shortcomings. Did you feel sick the night before? Did you want to throw up? Uh, did you call your mom and say, what the hell am I doing? Um, <laughs> and what mistakes did you make? Because we all did that. I know Jake, you don't want to say that. I felt listen, I'm like, what am I doing here? You know, I got my mom in the background going, you're crazy. You got to feed six kids. What are you doing? You know, so I'll go there. So I want to hear, you know, your fears. I want to deep down inside. What did you do wrong with the property? What were you afraid about? You know, let me hear that. Yeah, is this on the six, that very first six unit? Very first, yes. Yeah, for me, uh, it was I had I was uh, concerned most, I guess, about managing the tenants. Right, this is kind of like a C minus area. Not that it was dangerous, just kind of a working class area. But you know, it's kind of a rough crowd in, in this market. If your rents are five and a quarter, man, you just kind of have a rough, rough crowd. Mm -hmm. So I'd always dealt with single family tenants. Somebody renting a house for fifteen hundred bucks a month. They've got a decent job. They got a decent credit score. They qualify, you put them in the house, they pay online, and you, you don't hear from them again until lease renewal time. That was my experience to date. So I was concerned about kind of managing these tenants. Luckily, there wasn't really any deferred maintenance on the property, so I didn't have to deal with that. Um, honestly, the on a fear level, that first single family house was really way scarier, way scarier, just because it was it was my first foray into real estate investment period. So by the time I'd already done dozens and dozens of single family houses. I'd had some ups and downs with contractors and I'd, I'd gotten used to handling, you know, larger sums of capital. And so I, I think the fear level wasn't quite as bad as far as things I messed up. You know, I think, um, just the management, you know, I'm not, I'm not a property manager, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of more of this like it kind of like, you know, strategic guy. I like investor relations. I like marketing. I like that kind of stuff. That's kind of where my strengths lie. And so to actually be signing leases and stuff was like, man, you know, it felt like, uh, I don't know if you, if, if, you know, I used to work in restaurants as a kid and they would bring in a new manager and they'd start him. He'd do one day on the dishes. He'd do one day on salad, one day on fries. And he'd go through every position in the, in the restaurant and then he'd be the manager after a month or whatever. And so I felt like running that six unit was like, well, that was, that was my time on the, on the dishes. You know, I, I had to do it, but I wasn't going to do it forever. So Devin, what do you say to these people? I mean, these gurus out there, I'll take Grant Cardone, for instance, he says, you know, you got to start big. I, I think that is great for selling uh, stuff and for being popular and all, but mm -hmm. hearing from your message and from Jake's message, you know, what would you tell the folks out there to start small? Because you started even small. You started with single family and you wanted to get into multifamily. What would your advice be on that? Well, I, I believe in that starting bigger because now that I own bigger properties, all these things that I've been hearing about economies of scale and that it's actually easier to run, you know, I believe it because I'm living it. The problem I think is I, I would not counsel somebody to go try and raise $3 million dollars never having run a property. So I, I'm a huge believer in partnerships. I think partnerships can get you there. Um, and there's lots of awesome creative ways to do that in multifamily. Maybe you're a corporate guy and you're making good money and you want to get into multifamily, but you're not going to go run the thing day one, but maybe you can help somebody. Maybe you can help somebody else raise a million dollars capital. You could be a general partner on that deal. 
you can be involved or maybe you can be a passive investor in a deal and put 50K in somebody else's deal and get to be a limited partner, get to be a fractional owner, get to see financials, get to see the whole process without actually having to go do it. So I, I think there's ways to get to start start right away in big 100 plus unit multifamily projects without necessarily having to be the guy that's running the entire thing. There's lots of ways to partner up and I'm a big believer in that. I don't disagree with you at all, but I've seen just from our time speaking with you, the progression of not your, your physical ability, but your mindset. It was going yeah. from that single family and then you get the confidence. Then you did a six unit and then you got the confidence and then you started getting money in from banks. Oh, I can do this. So it was really, I think it's, a, it's all a stacking of the mindset that you're, you're okay to be in this space now and you're comfortable being there because you've done it. Now you're going to go bigger. Oh, I can do this. Now I can step up and, and go and go. So I think it's, it, it's a lot of it. Like you said, you're, you're fighting internally with yourself. Yep. trying to put yourself in a position that I belong here. And the minute you get a taste of it, you're like, this is, this, is, this is not a big deal. I can do this, right? And I always say, this, is, this game that we're in is not rocket science. It's really not. And, and I think that if Gino and I can do it, I think you know, a lot of other people can do it. It's just, it's just taking action, getting in, pulling the trigger, getting a deal done, having that realization that, wow, this is, this is you know, we, we, we call it a, a three-legged stool, buy right, manage right, and finance right. If you, get, if you nail those three pieces of the business, you're going to be successful. It's just, if you screw up your financing, you're going to get burned. If you don't manage the thing properly, you're going to get burned. If you overpay, you're going to get burned. So it's, it's, it's kind of that acceptance that, wow, I, I can do this. This is, this is not something that's untouchable. So. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not rocket science, but um, it, to, to the new person coming at, at it, there's obviously a lot of lear learning curve and things like that. So partners or mentors, I think are a hundred percent indispensable. If you're looking sure. to go from not in this business to, being an actual owner. I like what you've done though because I did the same thing I, I started from the ground up I didn't stay there long but I signed some leases you know I've done every mm -hmm. aspect of our business so I fully understand it yep. so if I have an employee that comes and says something to me I can call bullshit and say no I've done that job you know you're, you're, yep. you're, you're full of shit you're being lazy or this that or the other thing so um, right. I think that I think that's invaluable so yeah I agree so Devin let, let me ask you uh, what is your buy criteria number one what do you what are your you know what are you looking to buy and um, the other thing is Everyone always asks us, how do you find deals? Yep. Yeah, great question. I'll start with the deals. I mean, we, we're starting to get into some off-market stuff, right? I've got a, you know, a CoStar license, which is a data source from my market where you can see, you know, owner cell phone numbers, right? And these guys get solicited all the time. I get solicited as an owner. You guys probably get solicited. So, um, there's that kind of that off-market strategy of contacting owners, networking with owners, and then there's brokers, right? I mean, the brokers really, that's their job is to find you stuff. So I'm under contract on a hundred unit property right now in San Antonio. Broker brought that to me, you know, so I emailed the broker that I have a relationship with and said, I'm looking for 80 to 200 units. And two days later, he's like, well, I got this off-market deal. And, and so that, you know, it's brokers and Brokers and owners is, is basically my strategy. In terms of buy criteria, I'm looking for B and C class properties, 80 units and up, preferably 100 units up. In San Antonio, Texas, a mentor told me a long time ago not to buy anything more than 30 minutes from my house. And uh, I've, so far, I've stuck to that. So we'll see if I can keep that up. I'm looking for... This is, I'm syndicating, exclusively syndicating now. So I am, this is 100% investor return driven. Right. I mean, that's the number one thing for me is am you I putting your own money into the deals as well. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I put a hundred to 200 K in any deal I do. Um, so it's investor return driven. And so what I usually do is build a five year pro forma. You know, we're going to sell, we're going to sell at year five. I want to be able to produce eight to 10% cash on cash returns to my investors during that whole period. And I want to be able to have a total equity multiple of two. So to me, that's a pretty easy story to tell investors. Look, I'm going to get you eight to 10% on your money, uh, quarterly distributions. And then at the end of the project, I want to have doubled your money in five years. You know? And for people that are in multifamily or have invested, they go, yeah, okay, that sounds reasonable. For people that have never invested in multifamily, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Double my money in five years? Are you, are you crazy? Is this real? You know, and I have to talk them down and go, like, look, there's syndicators all over the country that, that I know. And, and uh, this is what, you know, this is why we invest in multifamily because you've got the ability to do that. So that's my criteria. I want to be able to double investors money in, in five years. So you're fortunate to live in a, in a fantastic market, San Antonio, right? I mean, it's booming uh, job growth. I mean, it's just a nicer, newer city. What do you, what else do you like about San Antonio? 
Well, we're still flying a little bit under the radar. So, you know, Dallas, one of the hottest markets on the planet, right, for multifamily. Houston, although I would probably not personally invest in Houston because of the, uh, you know, the hurricane stuff and the, the susceptibility of, or the dependence on kind of the price of oil, you know. Um, but Houston's a huge market. Dallas, huge market. Austin is exploding, right? Uh, San Antonio is, 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 we're growing. We've got a great diverse economic uh, job base. We've got lots of things going for us, but we're still not like this red hot market. And I kind of like it that way. You know, San Antonio is just slow and steady. Even during 2008, you know, values just kind of flatlined for a little bit. They didn't tank. And so I like that San Antonio is growing we've got some good things going for us but it's not like red hot so i like that it's still very affordable here too from a single family and multi-family perspective from a renter's perspective it's still fairly affordable um we're starting to get some more you know uh, i guess amenities nice places to go things to do those things are kind of on the on the rise and so uh it's, it, it, it's good i grew up here and i'm starting to see some of these things uh come to fruition in terms of, of this town getting a little bit more of a, of a better reputation. But it's not, again, this red hot market that would make me a little bit nervous. Jay, guys, it's crazy. When I'm just thinking, as you're describing it, uh, I'm thinking about the San Antonio Spurs basketball team, right? They're amazing. Yeah, yeah. They're flying under the radar. They've got probably one of the top 10 best players ever to play for them. You know, um, they've won championships. And then you go over to Dallas. I'm a big Cowboys fan. You got the big blah, 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 big guys. They don't win anything, but they get all the publicity. They're red hot. So sometimes flying under the radar is a good thing, right? I mean, you know, right. Duncan is just amazing. If you think of it that way, that's a great market to look at. That's why I was attracted to Jacksonville a couple of years ago before Amazon came down here, all of a sudden the institutions start flocking in. So, um, you know, Hey, I don't want to shout out to everybody. Maybe San Antonio might be a place you got to look at. Right, Jake? No, no. I was just going to say, this is not the stuff you're going to find in the 2018 annual report. Okay. You so everyone goes out there and looks at these metrics and things like that. And everything that you're saying, I would invest today, hands down in San Antonio, just by what you said there versus Dallas or Austin, one of these other places, because I guarantee that you're finding more value than these other folks. Maybe there isn't a, such an appreciation play, but I'd rather own an asset in, in a market like that than in Dallas right now. So, yeah, so, the Spurs analogy is a great one, and that's spot on. I just, I'm, a, I'm, I don't like the coach, but I think the team is amazing. They've got systems, <laughs> and um, yep. let's transition into systems and teams and how you've been able to build a team, and, and that's re that's really important because let's go back to the Cowboys. They have no system. They have no team. I mean, I mean, I don't want to make the analogy, but who's running it? Who's running that asylum there? Uh, it all starts. <laughs> it all starts with the head coach. It all starts with the with the owner. I'm a big Cowboys fan. I, I don't who's like the coach? Him. Jerry Jones? I don't like the coach. I don't like him. I mean, <laughs> get out of the way. Hire guys who are competent. Don't have the ego. Get your ego out of the way. You have enough money. You've built an amazing business, an amazing franchise. You should be winning there. You should. Do they even have a GM? I don't know why. That's a good question, bro. Every it's, year it's they the Jerry Jones show, man. Dude, draft. I mean, every year it's always an excuse. It's like, come on already. I mean, you know, so I think systems and team building is really important. Can you just dive into, uh, you know, how you've experienced it and what you've been doing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I had the uh, privilege of hearing David Osborne speak, uh, very successful real estate investor, among other things, last week. And he was saying, uh, you, you know, you have to learn to work through other people. Right. And I, I fully subscribe to that. And I, I started building that early on in my investing career is basically how can I not do it? Right. Because I've got we've got this finite amount of time, all of us. And, and I've been really obsessed about finding, you know, uh, the, the highest dollar per hour activity that I can do and figuring out how to get rid of everything else. Right. So. Um, it's constantly in my life a process of refining that. How can I do more of the things that I'm good at and that are high dollar? And, and those things kind of coincide. The things that I enjoy kind of tend to be those higher dollar uh, activities and find a way to give the rest to everybody else. So in specifically speaking about multifamily, you're talking about leverage on a couple of things. You know, leverage uh, with the brokers. I, mean, I, I could spend a lot of time meeting other owners and that may yield a deal at some point, but I choose to leverage brokers instead because that's their whole job. So there's leverage there. I think the property management company is, you know, the most relation, the most important relationship you can have. I've got, I've done both, right? Self-managed and third party. And my future is with third party for a lot of different reasons, right? It, the scalability of it, the fact that a lot of the, um, 
you know, the accounting and things like that. And a lot of the day-to-day stuff can be handled by somebody that's been doing that for 15 years versus me trying to get in, involved in that. So the, the property management is absolutely critical. You know, the deal I'm doing right now, I, I have one relationship with property manager or the property management company and they're doing the due diligence. They're assisting with it anyway. They're going to be doing the property management and they're going to be doing the construction management. So those are a lot of pieces that I've done before myself, but now I'm bringing in a team to, to help run that, which lets me scale back on all these activities and really dial in on a few activities that, that I'm good at. And really that, that's you know finding great deals, underwriting great deals, raising capital and executing on those. And that, that's, that's what my role and needs to be and anything that takes away from that is potentially a bad move for my investors, right? I need to be focused on the things that that I'm good at and delivering those returns. So property management, huge. And then I'm also, you know, I've been investing in this market for a lot of years now. So I've got a lot of those contacts. You know, if I need a structural engineer to go look at something, um, you know, it's a text away because we've, we've got a relationship or same thing with plumbers or HVAC roofers. I mean, we got a lot of relationships with all these trades and they know me and they've been working with me for years. So there's something to be said about having those kind of relationships um, when, you, when you need to get stuff done on the fly. What is your best real estate investing tip or raising money tip for the listeners? Yeah. Best real estate investing tip is whatever you're trying to do, I think real estate or, or life, you find someone that has actually done it and you copy them exactly. So whether it's fitness, whether it's buying your first apartment complex, you're not inventing anything. None of us are really trying to uh, invent anything new necessarily, right? So if you're trying to do something, somebody's done it and somebody's done it well. Find that person and copy exactly what they've done. That's my biggest kind of number one takeaway. Um, what was the other question, Gina? The raising money one. I, I just want, since you've raised so many millions of dollars, I know you're a part of masterminds and all that. What, what is the best tip to raise money? It's, it's, it's tricky. I think for, for me, the, the most successful thing has been that I create a monthly newsletter and I, I send that out once a month. Also to that newsletter, I send out, uh, occasionally we'll send out a single family deal that needs funding because uh, pretty much all the single family stuff that my single family company does, we raise private capital on. And then uh, I send out any multifamily deals you know, to that list. So having a database that you can grow, even if you start with one person and send out a monthly newsletter that highlights you know, your successes. I use MailChimp because it's free and it looks great and you can see who's opening it. Right. So now my database is pretty big database, is probably 415 people right now. So it's going out to a lot of people because I built it up over the years, but every month they get a newsletter. Hey, here's the houses we sold this month. You know, here's the big renovations we did. Here's the, here's the interior of, um, you know, one of our units that before and after on this God awful apartment complex that now looks like this gorgeous unit. And so just providing people that proof month after month after month, they might not invest with you for 24 months. But after that time, they've seen 24 of your newsletters. They've seen all these projects that you've done, all these successes that you've had, um, and, and it starts to build a little bit of credibility. So most of the people in my database have not invested, but they see that over and over and over again. And then finally, a project hits where they actually, they're in a position to invest. They've been seeing your stuff. Um, and that's been huge, I think, for just getting, letting people get to know me and my business without actually you know, maybe seeing them every day. Another thing, too, I think is, you have to, it's chicken and egg. You have to have the track record to raise capital. If you don't have the track record, you need to get with somebody that does and figure out how you can add value. Uh, but once you start to build that track record and you've, you know, returned capital for some people, then it's time to ask for some referrals. Because if you've got a, if you've got a doctor that's invested with you, who are all his friends, right? They're all doctors. So once you've performed and you've earned the right to ask for a referral, then you can ask for referrals. And I think at some point, you know, you hit this tipping point where you've got a lot of people coming in and, and looking to invest based off of word of mouth. So that goes back to my philosophy as a syndicator is it's a hundred percent investor return driven because I would rather just stay at home and sit on my hands than get to a project that I didn't think could perform. Because if I get into a project that can't perform, my career is over, right? As the investor syndicator. So it's all about 
your reputation. I believe in this business, you've got one um, chance to mess up and then you're done. You know, I've heard about people that have not returned capital or, you know, guys that have stolen money or whatever. You, you, get one, you get one shot at that and then you're done forever in my mind. So it's 100% about getting into projects that you know you can deliver on. And then once you do that, uh, you know, people are going to come banging, banging on your door. I have the solution here. You got a 400 person list. You have the track record. They're starting to see the newsletter, but they really maybe haven't heard from you. But now you come on the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast, you send this out to your list, and they really hear from you, and they can, they can understand the passion and enthusiasm. And now we convert all of them, and then the money starts flowing in after this week because they're going to hear from you. I'm just saying. That's my prediction. That's all I'm going to say about that. And we're going to take a quick break to give a shout-out to our sponsor, CrowdStreet, who believes investors of all sizes should have access to quality commercial real estate investment opportunities. The CrowdStreet Marketplace features vetted commercial real estate investment offerings from over 100 sponsors from across the U.S., Download a free copy of their commercial real estate investing guide at crowdstreet.com backslash wheelbarrow. Gino, anything about CrowdStreet this week? I know, I you, think, I know you're throwing the plugs. I think Devin's going to be a, a potential CrowdStreet guy because uh, they're a great platform. We've got uh, about 150 investors on there right now. They have a great CRM. They've got a great platform where you can actually put deals on there. So, Devin, I think you got to check them out. They're, they're the real deal. They're a great company. They're a great company to work with. They jump on the call with you. They'll walk you through the whole process. Um, we love it. I mean, we're, we're, we're in touch with a bunch of mastermind guys. We have a mastermind group with a bunch of syndicators. A lot of them are using it. That's how we found out about it. And we're using the company now, and they're great. Excellent. My favorite question to ask every week is, what is your best habit for success? You've been a successful guy over a long period of time now, entrepreneur. What is the thing that you do daily or weekly that has really propelled your career? Constantly focusing on high dollar uh, activities. How do you do so, that? Well, I, I, can tend, I can be a pretty analytical guy. Since you asked, I created a spreadsheet. One column has uh, one through four. In terms of enjoyment, whether it gives me, and actually, you know what? One through, oh, oh, sorry, column has one through four on uh, dollar value, with you know one being low, very low dollar value, four being like the highest dollar value, right? I mean, if I'm negotiating and I negotiate a two hundred thousand dollar discount on a property, you know, that's that's two hundred thousand dollars in in five minutes. That's a pretty good hourly rate, right? So that would be an example of a high dollar task. Then I have a column of enjoyment or energy. Does, is this a zero? Am I neutral on it? Is it a plus three? Is it giving me a lot of energy or is it a negative three or anywhere on that spectrum? And then I list, so I list, I have a tap, a list of, you know, 150 tasks, anything I do during the course of business, I write it down. It goes into a list and then I rank it by, is it giving me energy or taking me energy, taking energy from me? And is it worth a lot of money or is it not? And then what I do is just filter it. And I want to see just the tasks that give me energy and that are worth a lot of money. And it's like 12 things. And I just try to focus on those 12 things. How can I do more of that? And then I look at the rest and go, who can I delegate this to? How can I get rid of this? And so that's been a very illuminating example or exercise for me to go through and actually name the tasks that I do. And anytime I find myself doing those tasks that are taking energy from me and that are low value, it's just a constant reminder of I need to give this task to somebody else. So I've been, I've been very good over the years to get rid of a lot of those tasks that, that steal energy from me and are not worth much. And so I have other people doing those now. And I'm certainly not perfect at it. It's a constant refining process. But I've gotten pretty good over the years at just focusing on the high dollar stuff that gives me energy. And because I'm focusing on the energy aspect of it too, I'm constantly doing stuff all day that is giving me energy. And that's a... That's like the, it's like the best way I could imagine to live. I don't ever want to retire. You know, I mean, I, I take vacations and I have family time, but work is an absolute joy for me because I just focus on the stuff that gives me energy. Do you have a, uh, and it doesn't have to get too personal with your stuff on it, but do you have a, uh, maybe a uh, example or a download of that we could put in the show notes to share with the listeners? Because I think people would get really uh, jacked up about that. So if you do, great. If not, that's fine too. But yeah, yeah. I sure do. Yeah. I can, I can kind of uh, make the spreadsheet a little more generic. And yeah, yeah. Share that. Yep, absolutely. 
uh, that's to add a lot of value to the folks. So we greatly appreciate that. Um, what about a multifamily mistake that you made along the way that you can share with folks so they don't uh, duplicate that? Sure. I think, I think one of the ones that sticks out for me is um, last year I bought a 75 unit property, 32 K a door, which in San Antonio is like, you know, unheard Air of. guitar, not, you're partying. Yeah. <laughs> not a bad, uh, not a bad uh, area. And 15 K a door on rehab, right? Crazy. I mean, we touched everything, right? I mean, just, you know, took it down to the sheetrock and replaced everything. But anyway, um, because I had all these contacts, GCs and painters and everything, I just thought, well, I'm going to bring in my own crews from my single family stuff and, ha and, and have these guys attack it. You know, I, I know they're, they, they, we can get it done at the right price and everything. The point is that we ended up kind of cycling through some of those vendors because they just weren't up to the scale of moving up. Just because I kind of moved into this multifamily world didn't mean a lot of those crews were. So we kind of had to cycle through some of those crews and fire some guys and really find some vendors that were capable of that scale. And so that was a mistake trying to take my little crews from some single family stuff and just think it, I could just apply it to the larger project. They just didn't. It was almost like a project management bottleneck for them. They just couldn't imagine I've got 20 units to renovate. You know, they're used to doing like a house at a time and they just didn't scale. And so we ended up having to change quite a few vendors out from, you know, granite fabricators to GCs to painters. And, um, you know, so, so on my current project that I've got under contract, you know, I'm looking exclusively for vendors. Show me what you show me another hundred project, a hundred unit project that you've done. Right. Show me that you've got the wherewithal to handle this kind of project. So that was a mistake thinking that, um, that I could get it done with these smaller teams. And it, was, it wasn't the right call. Great example, even yesterday, I was on the phone um, interviewing a, a new landscape company. And uh, it was, you know, as a question I had for them, I said, what other apartment complexes of this size have you done, right? Yeah. And that's, so that's the kind of thing, guys, it transfers a lot of places. So I think that's a great tip. <clears throat> what is a, a book recommendation? Uh, it could be general business, you know, motivation, you know, apartments, anything like that, but that has made an impact on your life that you think other people should read. Yeah, well, there's always the, the Jake and Gino book, right? Wheelbarrow Profits, baby. <laughs> Great book. I recommend everybody read that. Um, the one that was important to me a long time ago was Thinking Grow Rich. There it is. What about profits? Endorsed by Devin Elder. Go, go get it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, Think and Grow Rich I read in high school, and I didn't realize at the time what impact it was going to have on me, but I realized all these years later that it planted seeds that I am forever grateful for. That's kind of a classic one. Um, Gary Keller has got uh, the Millionaire Real Estate Investor. It's been a while since I read that, but that was instrumental to me. Um, honestly, in the multifamily space, I love podcasts, man. I mean, that's, that's really almost more, it, it's hearing these stories of just regular people that have quit their job or whatever. I consume podcasts constantly. I mean, you guys, podcasts are a phenomenal resource. And I love just being able to plug in on otherwise uh, dead time of like, say, driving or whatever, and be able to download that. I think that's hugely helpful. So a couple of resources there. You know, I, I think that Think and Grow Rich is one of these books that every book that's been in that similar genre has followed, has taken a piece of it, and then elaborated on. I mean, I know Gino's reading The Go-Giver right now, and, and if you really go back to Think and Grow Rich, you could take a section of Think and Grow Rich, and they've basically dedicated a book to it. So there's, uh, there's so many instances where every, every book that's followed is almost a section of that elaborated upon. So I, I totally agree with that. Um, awesome. What about just how do I say this? A, a great deal that you've done and, and a learning experience that you can take from it and say, Hey guys, this is something that we didn't expect, but we, we saw it throughout this apartment deal and look for this, or it's, it's really been something that we kind of uh, look for now. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, you know, the, the apartment business, like you said, is it's not rocket science. I mean, you're just looking to make a nice product that you can have a, a competitive price on and be better than, you know, better than the, the, the sub market. And I found that, I don't, I don't know if this directly answers your question, but there's a lot of people, I guess, apartment owners that it looks like they're not really trying. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a, 
mom and pop subpar, game. Mom and pop subpar renovation, if you can even call it that. But you know, you go in and you put some vinyl plank floor down and some new paint and maybe some new fixtures and resurface some countertops. That stuff doesn't cost a ton of money, but man, you can have a nice impact. Or like staging a unit. You know, I've seen people, a lot of people don't stage a unit, kind of mom and pop, or people that do, they really half ass it. And it is not that hard or that expensive to make a staged unit look amazing, right? And, or, or something like putting a, uh, this is such a small example, but it has a massive impact, putting like a Glade plug-in or something in there, right? So that when huge people come that, in, that, they're yeah. getting hit on their, that sense when, when that, th- what does it cost you? Four bucks, you know, and, it, and they're getting hit on that sense. But this is little things that I think a lot of kind of mom and pop operators, like you said, are not doing that can have a, a really big impact when people are deciding where they're going to spend the next 12. My, or- my thing right now is the, bo- the Bohemian South Beach music. So when you come in, not only you get hit in the face with the glade, but you got that nice <laughs> vibe going. Everybody starts yeah. doing a little bit of this. Yeah, we're partying yes. now. Let's do this. Right? <laughs> You're still a lifestyle, right? You're still a lifestyle. That's exactly so, right. It's 100%. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So um, uh, what project are you excited about right now? Well, I'm really excited about this hundred unit I have under contract. Um, there's, there's several opportunities. <clears throat> the property's paying almost all of the utilities right now. So there's an opportunity to, to shift those over the next year um, to the tenants and reduce some expenses. There's a very interesting opportunity to add uh, 24 units to this property. And I, I won't go into all the details, but I'm very excited about that. Um, and we're, you know, we're, our feasibility is up in about a week. So this is kind of like the last week to really make sure everything's dialed in before that earnest money goes hard. And um, I'm, I'm very excited about the inspections that have come back on that. And, you know, we scoped all the line, the sewer lines last week and everything came back good and uh, HVAC stuff's come back good. So this property that I underwrote based on some projections, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, everything's coming back kind of a, a little bit better in terms of the financing and in terms of the renovation costs. I'm very pleased with how that's unfolding so far and looking forward to getting that one closed and then start executing the, the business plan. Very nice. What's the best way for listeners to get a hold of you if they want to learn more about your company or if they want to invest, uh, et cetera? Yeah, the best kind of catch all would be the main company website. Uh, my company's called DJE Texas Management Group. So you can find us at djetexas.com. And that's got, you know, links to the social media. I've got the YouTube channel where I kind of explain some of these multifamily concepts for maybe new investors and things like that. That'd be the spot to go. Nice. G Dad, what else you got? Um,. I like the Glade. I'm thinking about the Bohemian music still, bro. I'm trying to get oh, he, He's partying right now. He's, 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 he's lost in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to thank Devin for coming on, sharing his story. Um, I hope I can get that downloaded because that's important. I think people need to write. Jake and I have got our yearly, daily, weekly tasks, and we're, we're big into like – self-development and I think the thing is you you work on yourself a lot right I mean that's what it is and people are afraid to work on themselves because sometimes they don't like what, what comes out but that's okay because I was doing the same thing you're doing I was washing dishes for 15 bucks an hour and that's what drove me out that's what drove me out of my business because I was doing those low level tasks I had the low energy so you cannot understate what he said in that segment Jake it's so powerful because you talk about Steve Jobs remember something that you love to do and you and you really love and passionate about it and you're good at it you'll continue to do it and you'll continue to get positive results and you'll continue to pick up the phone, call the broker, and you'll continue to take those actions that will make you successful. But if you have that low level of energy, you're not going to do that. So um, that was huge. Yeah, because you're, you're partying. You're having a good time doing it. You know, you're, right. you're, you're making those big transactions. Things are happening and you're enjoying that's it. Right. So. so I just want to thank that's, you. Yeah. That's the connection there. I, I just think people get lost in that and they think it's, you know, they love sewing. So they want to go and start sewing, you know, a million quilts a day. That's not, that's not what the people are talking about. Mm-hmm. So. so I just want to thank Devin for being on and um, speak to you soon. Right. Awesome. Thank you, fellas. Love it. Thanks guys. Thanks guys. We trust that you enjoy the wheelbarrow profits podcast. Visit Jake and your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.